Davar, my good friend. Yes, my friend, my hog. I have a gift for you, my good friend. Oh, what's what's this, this gift? It's the gift of Mad Dog. Drink it in, man. Oh, wow. Um, define what is the gift of Mad Hog? Shut up, you stupid idiot. Uh, uh, here, I was thinking you were going to lead into something. Uh, I am. I'm referencing Chris Jericho. So, oh, that's probably why I haven't yes, seen Chris Jericho in years. I think that uh, explains, or I should say exposes, your lack of wrestling following as of late, apart from WCPW. <laughs> as for me, yeah. as for me, this is the sheer amount of wrestling I watch on a weekly basis. I start off with WCW... Uh, the, I start off with WCW. <laughs> w- w- I meant to say WCPW. <laughs> Imagine that. WCPW Monday Nitro. <laughs> no, I start off with the WCPW. Let's see how many times I can say that acronym. Loaded, which I watch live on their YouTube channel. On the What yep. Culture Wrestling YouTube channel. And then I watch WWE, Monday Night Raw, SmackDown Live. There has been a second brand split recently, if you're not aware. So now yeah. I have to watch SmackDown as well, because it has now its own roster. <laughs> and, and its uh, own plot and everything. <laughs> yes, well, actually it's pretty good for now, but I foresee an inevitable decline as the years go by, as the same problems that haunted the original brand split they did in 2002 are going to be manifested again, and they're going to repeat history all over again, call me cynical. Anyway, uh, Monday Night Raw and SmackDown Live. Then I move on on Wednesday to watch NXT and the Cruiserweight Classic Tournament, which is... Amazing! I'm going to talk a bit more in detail about a match that I saw recently in that series. Then I also watch Lucha Underground whenever it's on. Right now they're taking a season off. Right. And finally, there is Ring of Honor. That is... That's a lot. Yeah, that is the amount of wrestling that I watch on a weekly basis. That's a lot of wrestling. You, it's like you're overdosing on wrestling. I think I am, but uh, to be fair, uh, it's hard to find the time to do so. But for something that I love, I do find the time. This is taking a lot of hours during the week, and uh, I have to prioritize certain shows over others. But it's all worth it. This is a great time to be a wrestling fan, and I am being a very big wrestling fan as of late. I've never been this passionate about it, not even years ago, when I only watched WWE. Now my mind (laughs) is expanded towards multiple realities of wrestling, including the British scene, thanks to my chosen window to that scene, which is WCW. Again, WCPW. (laughs) WCPW. P-W, there is a P in (laughs) W-C-P-W, damn it, Uh, I I bet Adam Blumpier chose that acronym specifically to spite me, because it's similar to W-C-W, and the guy is basically a clone of Eric Bischoff, (laughs) Yeah, well, Eric Bischoff is the, uh, his, well, spirit animal, as he always says, I... You know, Probably it's, paint job, I would rather say. It's really difficult sometimes to uh, separate the what culture journalist part of the company from the wrestling promotion, the actual real-life wrestling promotion that they have. Uh, yeah. Because they have the same characters uh, just alternating in between the journalist part and the wrestling part. Uh, it's a bit difficult to sometimes to separate the two entities, and 
because of that sometimes it's hard to take these promotions seriously but they're doing their darnest to make us think it's a big deal by just showering us with the most uh, unpredictable talent acquisition you could have from a indie wrestling promotion that just started months ago two months ago to be specific it's very crazy <laughs> Yeah, What's been I mean, coming out from them? They immediately announced uh, Damien Sandow, ex WWE guy, and everybody went crazy because for some reason they love him. I'm going to expand on my feelings about Aaron Stevens, aka Damien Sandow, later on. Don't worry about it. And then they follow it up with Cody Rhodes, and then there is going to be an appearance for Kurt Angle. They're even going to start up a freaking Royal Rumble to give somebody the honor to face Kurt Angle. <laughs> Which I think <laughs> is kind of stupid. Honestly, you should have that kind of match to determine number one contenders for your main title, not to face a guy that makes one or maybe two appearances a year. But uh, I digress. And then they're going yeah. to have a one-night-only uh, special appearance by Eric Bischoff and Jim Ross and Jim Cornette. How can they afford all these people? But yes. Well, apparently they have the money. They have the money coming out of their ears, apparently. So, as you can tell, this wrestling podcast, uh, which I'm yet to come up with a name for, um, it's something that me and Devar wanted to do in a while, and we said months ago that we might actually do this, because there is surprisingly a lot to talk about already, about this... Promotion and uh, wrestling in general. I, I want to talk, I would love to talk more in depth about uh, wrestling in general on a weekly basis because of all the things I watch. Devar, on the other hand, he just watches Loaded. So, um, for the yeah, sake of because... having a back and forth argument, I am too going to focus on uh, Loaded. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, sorry about that, but I really. Uh, I rarely have the time to watch all the wrestling you have the time for. <laughs> Somehow, miraculously. Yeah, I, <sighs> I, I could not even pull a miracle like that. I, it, it's, it's taken all my power to even catch WCPW, at least. You were about to say <laughs> WCW. I noticed that. You, you caught yourself at the last second. <laughs> yes, because I'm in my head going... Don't forget the P! Don't forget the P! Don't forget the P! <laughs> it seems like an acronym specifically designed to induce some Freudian lapse. <laughs> it doesn't help, but also, uh, when it comes to me, I'm all, I'm used to the uh, free-lettered wrestling promotions. <laughs> yes, well... It's not a, for. <laughs> well, it's a good thing you uh, do not watch NJPW. NJPW uh, is what you said? Yes, NJPW. Yeah, I don't think I know that one. It's New Japan Pro Wrestling. Um, it's like ah, it's, that one. It's only the second most uh, important wrestling promotion on the planet. <laughs> yes, I, I know now, now that you've said what it is. <laughs> and actually, I do not watch it as well, because it's really difficult to watch, uh, to find, I should say. Anyway... Yeah. Uh, which is too bad, because uh, if a match that I watched last week on the Cruiserweight Classic Tournament is an indication of the stiffness of the competition in Japan, I wish I could watch it on a regular basis, because let me tell you, that match, it's the best thing that I ever laid eyes upon. It was a work of art, beautiful and devastating. A poetry of devastation. It was so good. I think it's my second best favorite match of the year. It's right up there with Shinsuke Nakamura versus Sami Zayn earlier this year. I only remember watching one match of Shinsuke Nakamura and that was him versus AJ Styles. Ooh. That was recommended. That match was recommended to me highly by my good friend, C. Oh, yes, that match was so and, good. Oh. Yeah, so when I took a watch of that match, that was like uh, such a great uh, wrestling from those two. And you know what? Different styles. As, yeah. good, as good as that was, it was not as good 
as the match that came right after that one, the main event of Wrestle Kingdom 10, the 45 minutes long epic battle between uh, the then and JPW champion Okada and yeah. the challenger, which I think was named Taka Hero. I could get this wrong. But anyway, it was fantastic. You didn't even need to know what was the story going into the match. The psychology of it, the hard, stiff hitting, hard action, kicking out of each other finishers the whole time, just told a story in its own right. It had the feel of a big time conclusion of a really long feud that spanned throughout many years, which it did, by the way. It was glorious. Glorious! Like the song. Yes. <laughs> it uh. was. So, yeah, that's pretty much, uh, <laughs> you know, some of the ideas of what we expect for a great wrestling match to be like, You know I what? would say. Yes, you know what? This seems like the perfect segue to talk about a rather controversial bout. And when I say controversial, I mean to me, personally. Yeah. Uh, that we saw on WCPW last week. Uh, we are recording this on uh, Monday night of the 16th of August. Actually, uh, it's basically a Tuesday morning. Yeah, pretty much. It's very late at night. August 2016. Uh, the latest episode of Loaded had just been streamed on their YouTube channel. And you watched the uh, triple threat match between uh, Will Osprey, Noam uh, Dar, and El Ligero, right? Yes. Yes. Will Osprey, Rad Moan, and El Ligero, as Simon Miller pronounces it. Yes. <laughs> Your uh, nickname for Noam Dar, you can finally use it. Yes. Have you noticed that uh, if you reverse Noam Dar, it spells. Rad Moan. Have I ruined Noam Dar for you yet? I plan to do so because I don't really like Noam Dar. I'm sorry. I yeah. really don't. I really, really don't like Noam Dar. He's good. Good in the ring. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's good in the ring. But as soon as he picks up a microphone and has to speak, pro wrestling dies. That uh, man's yeah. voice. That man's voice is the death of wrestling to me. It is just Not... this incomprehensible, super thick Scottish accent that just comes out as garbled as humanly possible. You need subtitles to understand him. And it's not even just that. It's the intonation of how he cuts his promos that just sounds is completely unenthused. He's not even trying. It's really, really bothersome to watch and to listen to and it's the worst the absolute worst that WCW WCPW damn it <laughs> has to offer <laughs> Adam Blampier is showing all his teeth right now going ha ha oh shut up Adam you're not so smart <laughs> anyway uh, I'm not gonna lie his accent uh, really makes me wish that they sold him as a mute wrestler that just shows you what he is going to do by what he's going to do in the ring. Look, if he actually gets a job on WWE, they are not going to let him talk. You don't have to worry about that. They are not giving a microphone. He is not going to have to say anything. He's going to get a restriction order for that microphone. Let me tell you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, oh I can imagine. Oh, it's the other way around. It's the microphone that has to take a restriction order from Rad Moan's vocal cords. Jeez. Oh Jeez. my gosh. So anyway, we witnessed uh, Rad Moan's last match this week on uh, Loaded against the Doug Williams of all people. Uh, it was a really quickly and really poorly put together match with a really tacked on stipulation. Specifically, if Rad Moan lost, he had to abandon WCPW. And yep. uh, Doug Williams put on the line his match against Cody Rhodes, which is going to arrive at some point. 
in the company. Doug Williams won with a surprisingly clean roll-up. It mm. wasn't so much as a roll-up as it was a reversal of a roll-up. Anyway, it was a clean pin victory and uh, Rad Mohan had this final goodbye speech to the audience. <laughs> <laughs> And then he left forever. Goodbye forever, Radmoan. I will not miss you. I will not miss your voice. This is going to be specific because he was yeah. a decent wrestler at least. Okay, but let me give you an example of how bad his voice is. So he had this match with uh, the Ring of Honor champion Jay Lethal, which is one of the most charismatic men on the planet. Uh, yeah. At the special event of WCPW, which was titled Build to Destroy, and I bet somewhere Adam Blampier is giggling at his brilliance for choosing that name for the, the special event. They're all named like this, Refuse to Lose, Build to Destroy, very clever. Anyway, so <laughs> they, they had this title defense uh, between uh, Jay Lethal versus uh, Rad Moan at Build to Destroy. The match, I don't know if it was good or not, because honestly, I could not get invested in it to save my life. I was so completely and utterly out of it. Like, my brain just took a vacation to the Hawaii while that match was going on. Why? Because they preceded that match with a promo between Jay Little and Rad Moan. And they had... Oh. Rad Moan talk the most. Yeah, that was a bit of a... Uh, let's just say a slight miscalculation. I just have nothing else to say on that matter. Other than the match itself was decent. It's just I couldn't get invested either. I think the match between Jay Lethal and Ellie Guerrero was actually a much better match, not counting the uh, DQ finale via interference by Martin Kirby, which was his best moment as a heel, honestly. He teased the audience as to will he, won't he just uh, kick one of the participants of the match while they were down, causing the match to end. And <laughs> he teased them for a minute before actually doing it and ruining the match. That was the best heel <laughs> work that Martin ever did. And Martin, I love the guy. I cannot stay mad at him. He's a comedy wrestler, a real-life cartoon character. And all of his <laughs> yeah. matches, all of his matches is basically an over-prolonged Looney Tunes episode. Having an Elmer Fudd Bugs Bunny dynamic with whomever is wrestling against him. A really childish, cartoon loving part of me just can't help but enjoy them at some level or the other. Even though basically he brings down not only himself but everyone feuding against him. And you cannot <laughs> take seriously anything that's going on in that promotion because of shenanigans such as this one. But I guess he has his place. I mean, no one else does the crab-walking elbow drop that never hits his target. So... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just... You gotta love Martin Kirby when he tries to boast and do all the little things that uh, you expect would usually work, but it just ends up firing back in his face, like in a total cartoon sort of scenario. Yes, his matches with Ellie Garo, and I am misspelling his name on purpose, by the way, because... Yeah. <laughs> Ellie Garo, um, they were all like this. They were all like, you know that classic Looney Tunes episode in which Bugs Bunny has to wrestle the big brutish bearded guy, and he comes into yeah. the ring with the black mask, and he tries to... Uh, doing wrestling moves, but the guy is no-selling them so much, he actually starts <laughs> playing solitaire... In the mat. <laughs> yeah. So th that's the kind of tone that you had to expect from a Martin Kirby match. You had to know beforehand what you're in for. The guy is a Looney Tunes character. And uh, that's really all there is to him. Which is a shame because I think the guy is actually a pretty good wrestler. But he doesn't get to show it because he's relegated to that comic relief role. 
that yeah, really I'm... does not go anywhere. I, it will not do anything for his career in the long run. No, it won't. But I would suspect that, yeah, that he'll grow as this will go on. I would suspect. You know, you know where he will be immediately successful with his uh, shenanigans. Yeah, the CZW promotion. The Chikara promotion, which has silliness of this caliber pretty much on a regular basis, along with excellent wrestling, or at least that's what I've heard. In fact, I have to wonder if Martin Kirby's gimmick and gimmick matches are not inspired from CZW in one way or the other. That could be a possibility, yes. Are you familiar with CZW? Nope. Well, you would if you would watch Bochamania on a regular basis. <laughs> Mostly because that's where the Jesus meme comes from. Ah. Uh. Jesus! I love it. I just love it. Speaking of CZW, I believe last year they actually had a pretty important achievement unlocked, so to speak. Yeah. They had their first uh, female heavyweight champion. Oh. Which is something that in North America is never before seen. Yeah, which is a shame, really. We might see that happening in the near future in Lucha Underground, since Sexy Star won the um, their equivalent of the Money in the Bank briefcase in the form of a belt. Yeah. So that could be... Uh, thing that could happen. Anyway, so I being all over the map. Yeah, we really did get back on track here. I just want to ramble about wrestling every once in a while and I really don't get the chance to do so as much as I would unless me and Devara are just spouting out of context wrestling references during our med play episodes, basically. Uh, well, anything we're a part of really. <laughs> yes, everything. Because, uh, you know, especially on our beachside D&D campaign yes. <laughs> last episode. <laughs> yes. Well, I pretty much centered an entire episode of our playthrough of The Grey Garden, which is yet to be posted at this specific point in time of this recording, around the... Uh, <laughs> the glorious theme song of Bobby Roode. <laughs> Yes. Uh, and I will defend, and I will defend. Just amazing. Yeah. Okay, so... Originally, we wanted to talk a very specific match. A triple threat match in between Will Ospreay, which, as you know, as you might know if you watch What Culture Wrestling on a regular basis, won the Super J Cup back in Japan earlier this year and had one of the most uh, ludicrous and uh, very much debated matches of the year against Ricochet. Yeah. Ricochet, other than being the name of a cartoon character from uh, Mucha Lucha. Yeah. <laughs> if you recall that show. I do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> he also happens to be Prince Puma in Lucha Underground. Hmm. And he is good. He had a really, really good match with Rey Mysterio Jr., at Ultima Lucha, which ended with the wrong one going over, if you ask me. But anyway, so in light of that controversy, now I've watched this triple threat involving Will Ospreay and the other two guys, which I remind you are Rad Moan and Ellie Garo. <laughs> yes, <laughs> amazing match, my bad. <laughs> uh, you liked it? I really liked it quite a lot. For oh. what it was. Okay. I mean, I know what's coming, so you might as well get yours out of the way. Uh, I want to hear your full-on opinion, because it is obvious at this point that we are going to have very different opinions about it, much like the entirety of the internet has for every Will Ospreay match ever. <laughs> well, <laughs> I'm trying to think how to start this now, because each of the men in that ring were like, really good at what they do. It's, you know, Eligaro flying everywhere. No. Yes, Eligaro, the man with the most telegraphed moves in existence. Yeah, they're telegraphed, but you uh, you kind of, you know, just... I, seriously, he spends a second too many on that rope 
before doing his spring boarding maneuvers and what have you. I mean, by the time he gets off the rope, uh, dinosaurs have come back to life and gone extinct again. <laughs> Uh, I just kind of just let him let him off for that one, just just because. Anyway, uh, uh, Nam Da, you know what I think about him. Uh, yes. Will Ospreay, though, he is very nimble and has a lot of agility on him. Oh though. yes, definitely, he's the king of nimbleness. I never seen anyone being so ridiculously agile and flying I mean, all over the place is flipping like a dolphin essentially he's like if you took jeff hardy and you mixed him with just about any madman who goes into the ring because he just backflips everywhere he's doing cartwheels to dodge people it just changes your perception of how you would see a wrestling match to take place essentially because this is my first time seeing Will Ospreay in action, so maybe that's why I'm, I was so like, oh my god, this is so awesome, he's so cool, because um, he's like an assassin. I baby. guess we'll have to take, yes, he's Assassin's Creed, which I did not no, like. No, I do uh, not like that part either. But... I like his nickname, the Aerial Assassin. I like less his connection with Assassin's Creed. Yes. Because Assassin's Creed is stupid. But anyway, I can see why you would fall in love with this since you have not watched wrestling regularly on a long time. Yeah. But me, on the other hand... Yeah. Okay, let me take a sip of water before because I'm going to make a lot of people mad, I think. Well, you know, if a lot of people listen to this... Yes, I was drinking as well, just to... Hey, get ready. <laughs> okay. When I watched this match, and uh, I heard all about the controversy about Will Ospreay's um, style in the ring, I understood why there was controversy to begin with, why some people were amazed by the acrobatics, and some other people thought his matches were basically over-glorified spot fests. Style over substance, basically. Yeah. And if you want my opinion, I had mixed feelings about it as soon as I finished watching it. I didn't feel like there was much to take away from it. It was a spectacle in its own right. But for some reason, there wasn't anything about it that really stick with me. Because every single move was a move. Every single move was a highlight reel spot worthy kind of move. And if every move is special, that no move is. And it's just the way the match was executed. As soon as it started, there wasn't a moment in which the match was allowed to breathe, in which the wrestlers were allowed to breathe and to show with their body language the damage that they received. The selling was basically absent from this match, because there was no time to selling. We had to get to the next special move and on to the next and to the next. We cannot have this match slow down for a second. We cannot have a proper sense of pacing set in. There is no crescendo to an explosive climax followed by a moment to breathe in and get the scope of it and then start all over again and then eventually getting to the really memorable spots. No, everything was the equivalent of a flat line. It was all one tone, one pace, one heartbeat, in which nothing really stood out because everything stood out at once. Now, don't get me wrong, I enjoy crazy acrobatics and aerial moves just like the next guy, but you know what I enjoy more? A build-up. <laughs> well, Obviously, a build-up, a crescendo, leading to a climax, you know, everything that makes the wrestling equivalent of storytelling yeah. worth watching in the first place. Yeah. There wasn't a story being told in this match. There was no psychology and there was no selling whatsoever. And there really wasn't any motivation for this match to exist in the first place. You should not have a triple threat match without a reward at the end, just for the sake of an exhibition. That's dumb, if you ask me. But anyway, I like my acrobatic aerial maneuvers 
when they actually have consequences. Yeah. If you miss a move, you suffer the consequences. If you hit a move, your opponent and even yourself suffer consequences. I want this to look and to feel like they hurt, that they leave an impact. That's what selling is for. That's what in-ring psychology is for. If there is no selling to the moves, because they had to be as quick as possible and get to the next special move, and to the next one, and to the next one, and so on and so forth, then there is nothing really that holds your attention to the match itself. It's, as people say, an over-glorified spot fest. Now, take into consideration another match that came out in the same week that this triple threat was broadcast. And uh, it's a match that I already mentioned earlier on as my second best, most favorite match of the year. Yeah. It was a battle that took place at the beginning of the second round of uh, the Cruiserweight Classic Tournament. Kota Ibushi versus Cedric Alexander. Okay, that match had everything. It did a psychology, a clear motivation and goal. The announcers also helped up in that regard. There was selling. There was yeah. stiffness. So much stiffness. The stiffest kicks and punches makes you cringe and crunch your bones every time you hear them. And that there were aerial killing maneuvers. There was technicality inside and outside the ring. There was tension, a crescendo, suspense, a build-up, a climax. It was well-paced in a satisfyingly fast manner. There were no dead moments in the match. There was still a sense of uh, crescendo, of build-up to the most iconic moments of the match itself. I talked about how selling and how the delivery of certain moves are important to make the move stand out, right? Yes. In the Will Osprey match, every move is a highlight reel move. It's a spot. Every move is a spot. And none of them are memorable because of that. Kota Ibushi can make a drop kick. A freaking drop kick look like the most lethal weapon in existence. <laughs> That's how good it was. That's how good that match was. This is what I like in my wrestling diet. Yeah. Not just a spectacle for the sake of a spectacle. That's not really a spectacle to me. I can understand that uh, argument, but I would put it to you that uh, if it's only Will Ospreay, it doesn't matter. If it's only Will Ospreay, then I'm willing to let it go as a, like, as a treat sort of thing, because... If only if it's kept at this sort of match sort of thing, where basically it's like him testing his skills against other high flyers and other technically talented wrestlers, then that's good enough for what it is. But uh, again, if he was to go any higher into the ladder, he would need to really step up the game of spacing things out a bit better whether it's him or whether it's whoever is coming up with the matches involving his moves. Yes. Did I tell you that he's going to have a match against the big Van Vader? <laughs> yes. Oh, gosh. <laughs> okay. If anybody can actually force Will Osprey to slow down when it's necessary to slow down and let the match breathe, to build up tension anew... That is Vader. Even though the guy is 60, he still looks like he's 40. He's still this beast of a man that's so scary to look at. And uh, this match is happening because of a Twitter war, of all things, between Vader and a journalist. <laughs> now, I wouldn't say it is the death of wrestling. No, Rad Mohan Tolkien is the death of wrestling. Personally... I don't like it. I think that match, that Willow Spray match that we just described, is uh, style over substance, ultimately. 
the style is nice, but there is no psychology, selling, or all the other little elements that make wrestling great yeah. to back it up. There is no story going in or going out. There is none of that. And uh, because of that, it was not a memorable match. In fact, ironically, the most memorable spot of that triple threat was... Uh, when Rad Moan locked the other two into his submission move at the same time. And the reason why it was so memorable is because it was not an aerial maneuver for once. <laughs> yeah, that was actually it was pretty not, good. It was not the umpteenth example of flipping around that these guys did the entire match. So yeah, Vader's going to slap him like he did Ken Shamrock. He's <laughs> up! He's <laughs> up! <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I would love to see that. Would love to see how Will Spray can fare uh, with an opponent that's a completely different size, different league, and different style of wrestling altogether. Yeah, that's going to be his final exam, really. <laughs> yeah, and uh, if he fails, he gets a punch to the face. <laughs> he gets a close line that looks like a punch that looks like he kills you <laughs> to the face. If you have not watched the Kota Ibushi vs. Cedric Alexander match, go watch it because it's fantastic. It was so good, in fact, so good, that at the end of it, yeah. the crowd just started chanting, please hire Cedric, <laughs> multiple times. And then, to the surprise of everybody, Triple H comes out, he shakes... Cedric's end, and he thumbs up the crowd, implying that he's going to be hired. Wow. The best part is, the guy lost the match. Wow. So that should tell you something. It tells me a lot, just from that it's, description. It's the kind of bout that puts both people in it over, just by virtue of being there to deliver the most fantastic match you could see. The previous week match in between uh, Johnny Gargano and Tommaso Ciampa, yeah. which was also very, very, very good, was a tough act to follow. Not only did they follow it this past week, they surpassed it. Wow. It was really, really good. I mean, Kota Ibushi kicks like a damn. <laughs> when he kicks you... It looks like he's beheading you. <laughs> I mean, it's not even kicking you in the head. He's kicking you in the chest. And it looks like the head might explode because of that. Jeez. And he has this really cool uh, last ride powerbomb into a sit-down finishing. Yeah. Uh, which is called the um, Golden Sun Powerbomb, I think. I could be wrong. But it's, yeah. it's really good. The Cruiserweight Classic is the best thing WWE has done all year long. It's really great. I want you to catch up all the episodes and watch these people. Uh, there were some really cool returns, such as Tajiri and Brian Kendrick. Yeah. And, and new faces that are really, really waiting for you to discover them, including this uh, Galahair fellow, yeah. which comes into the ring with this... Squirrely moustache, looking like the quintessential British gentleman. <laughs> <laughs> and it's great. <laughs> uh, so, I believe I gave you my opinions about this match and why... Yeah, uh, you did. <laughs> uh, that, that was a very long discussion on Will Ospreay alone. <laughs> yes, well, he made only one appearance in WCPW. Yeah, but I think it's high time we talked about it, and and you've seen a couple of different opinions about it. Uh, Davara liked it, yeah, and I didn't. <laughs> I mean, I did not uh, dislike it, but it's not one of those matches that really stays with me. Like I said, it's a, it's just like a big piece of cake that you're just going to enjoy, and then. You have other things to enjoy afterwards. Okay. So let's talk about more of WCPW. Uh, yes. Uh, we have a lot of people still. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> we might actually cover what happened this week because uh, it's still fresh in our mind. Yeah. I mean, do we want to talk about the match with Martin Kirby and Grado? <laughs> 
I really don't, <laughs> but there is that one spot in which they try to shove the toothbrush into each other's mouth. Context, they, they yes. Martin Kirby took it from... No, 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 yeah, I do not want to acknowledge that. <laughs> but, but what I liked about it is that they had a Duffy Duck Bugs Bunny moment in which they decided to do an impromptu alliance and trying to shove it inside the referee's mouth. <laughs> that was amazing <laughs> timing for comedy yes. wise. And that's yeah. all I want to say about that one. Amazing comedy between those two. And then, for some reason, Grado, whom looks like he's an even bigger comedy wrestler than Martin Kirby, gets put in a match with the uh, people that we actually like. That is Joe Hendry. Yes, Joe Hendry, please have my baby. And Joseph Connors. <laughs> <laughs> you know... Yeah. Joseph Connor's finishers, you told me off screen that you liked it. It's a DDT, but it's very different. It's like it's like he compacts the wrestler and then brings them down. So it's um, like, I don't know. It looks a bit convoluted for a DDT. It is convoluted, but at least it's different. At, like, at least it's not as convoluted as that one stupid finisher from one wrestler I saw. The one where the wrestler has to intentionally lift themselves up in the corner of the rope so the guy can jump off the top putting his feet into their chest I'm trying to remember what... I'm having trouble visualizing your idea of a finisher because uh, Sami Zayn has this finisher called the Haluva Kick in which he runs and kicks somebody in the face really really hard while he's standing on the ring post I'm trying to remember who it was now that did this finisher because I saw it, it was from a WWE Superstar and I thought it was really dumb because the opponent had to lift themselves up while the corner, you know, while his oh. legs were attached to the corner. Really. Oh, no, you're talking about the stupid, stupid finisher that Alberto Del Rio showcases on a regular basis nowadays. Yes, yeah. he's not doing that as much as before, but it is one of the dumbest, if not the dumbest finisher anybody could ever try. It made... No sense. Exactly. So, uh, th so anytime <laughs> the last finisher is my exhibit A to anyone that says this finisher is stupid. <laughs> it's not stupid. It's just um, I don't know. Not necessarily complicated. I mean, it's just a DDT. I know. I mean, but... if you want to make a DDT look cool, all you need to do is uh, basically slightly change the positioning of your arms in such a way that they include the shoulders and the arms. Basically a double arm DDT like the one that Mick Foley does or Dean Ambrose uses as a finisher nowadays to great and definitive effect. Yeah, that uh, I remember seeing that actually. It, it looks like it has a lot of uh, oomph to it <laughs> compared yes. to usual DDTs. It's a finisher that wins matches. Nobody really has kicked out of that finisher as of late, which is a good thing because Dean Ambrose is currently the WWE World Heavyweight Champion on SmackDown, and he beat his uh, Shield brothers, pinning Roman Reigns clean, because Roman Reigns is no longer the Golden Sun, <laughs> to great joy of everybody. Yes, <laughs> a great joy of everyone that I don't have to hear that complaint anymore. <laughs> and now, the main event scene on Raw looks like this. Seth Rollins versus Finn Balor. Ah, frick. Yes, yes, that's the reaction you should have. I don't know who Finn Balor is, so I don't know where I should be. Uh... Oh my god! Is it bad? <laughs> the VAR. Just look him up. Look out any given entrance by Finn Balor. That's all you need to do. Not now. Later on. All right. That's all you need to know about him to like him. Not only that, but also his name has deeply rooted roots, if you will, into the Irish folklore. Ah. Uh. He is Irish. But not in a stereotypical way like Seamus is. He's a guy who brings upon the actual culture of his country without looking like a leprechaun. <laughs> the guy is amazing. The guy is fantastic. 
Okay, so basically Finn comes from Finn McCool, which was this giant that threw a rock in the ocean and created an island. Yeah. And Balor was the Demon King, whose eye, if open, could cause the end of the world. Basically, his gimmick is that he can occasionally tap into the power of the Demon King to bring it up during his most important matches. Yeah. It's a great gimmick, and he's a great wrestler. And really, you should really, really know who Finn Balor is, otherwise we cannot be friends. (laughs) Oh my gosh, is that serious? Oh yes, and he's in the main event of Raw against Seth Rollins for the new belt that they have uncovered, which is sadly titled the uh, WWE Universal Championship. (laughs) Oh, I didn't know they owned the rights to those movies. Yes. The winner of that match will become the new Universal Monster Champion. (laughs) (laughs) I guess it fits if uh, Finn Balor, whom is supposed to be the Demon King, just uh, becomes the Universal Champion. (laughs) Next week, the Mummy versus Finn Balor. (laughs) Now, next week, the Yeti (laughs) versus Finn Balor. (laughs) Oh, yeah, the Yeti. (laughs) Which is the Mummy. Anyway, so... On the bright side, yeah. whomever becomes a uh, universal champion can also be addressed as such. The champion of the universe! Yes, champions of the universe. That sounds great, actually. <laughs> yes, it does. Uh... So anyway, on the other hand of the SmackDown Live conundrum, curiously enough, and to surprisingly great effect, Dean Ambrose is feuding against Dolph Ziggler, of all people. Ah, that guy. I mean, he's been a jobber for many years now. And suddenly he's projected to the main event scene, and he suddenly looks believable. It's amazing that they managed to do this on SmackDown. So now let's see what happens. He actually looks like he has a fighting chance against Dean Ambrose. Hmm. That's good then to know. Anyway, uh, back to WCPW. W- okay, this is how the podcast uh, goes, basically. This is how our wrestling podcasts are going to go. We just talk about whatever. We don't have a specific program. We just have rambling thoughts just to share with you. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> Especially me, because... I- I watch more wrestling. (laughs) I I think one controversial thing I'll be saying here, which is probably going to be met with, yo, you wrestling snob, you, is that um, besides Joseph Connors and Big Damon, and uh, maybe a couple of others, I haven't seen all the wrestling finishers moves yet, but not many of them seem to have very memorable finishers. They all seem quite you know, standard. Joe Hendry, most charismatic man on the roster. Joe yeah. Hendry's music, play Joe Hendry's music. I mean... Uh, uh, he's such a mega baby face. If, yes. If he's not the guy who defeats Big Demo, I'm going to be very upset. Yes, I think we all will be. But, uh, uh, but like I was about to say, he has a great charisma, he's really good in the ring, but then he pulls off the finisher of the fall away slam, and it's like any other fall away slam. What makes this one different? It looks cool when it does that to Big Demo, which is far bigger than him. Yeah, the, that's really the only thing that seems to be very uh, interesting about it, that he takes men double his size and chucks them over his head, essentially. <laughs> and really, other than that, I cannot think of any other reason of why this should be considered a finisher and this is probably why I consider myself a wrestling snob because I would like to see everyone have unique finishes at least that will be unique to them. That's funny you consider yourself a snob but considering WCPW is a wrestling company made by internet smarks for internet smarks. (laughs) In fact it's It's really unique as a company. The fact that this company exists is the best quality about it. Because it was entirely founded over internet success following. 
it streams its shows directly on YouTube. It does not have to answer to the obligations of a TV broadcast network. They do not have commercial breaks to ruin the flows of matches. That's great. That is definitely the promotion of the future. That's how wrestling promotions could become if this experiment really, really pays off and becomes super successful. Um, we'll see one year from now where that leads us. Yeah, it'll be nice to see where it goes because I just really like it myself because it's so different from uh, what you expect a wrestling company's origins to come from. And yet it's kind of like every other major company's immediately because they had the known finishes, they had the double turns, they had the... Uh, double crosses. <laughs> double crosses, they had the authority figures align themselves with the wrestlers just taking over the show and there are pretty generic heel stables in fact let's talk about prospect this heel stable of uh, old-timey prospectors with white beards <laughs> and overalls digging for gold <laughs> yes and one day when all what culture has more belts they'll be coming for your gold <laughs> yes they really aren't what we just said they are but we wish they were, because at least there will be an interesting gimmick, because as they are now, they are a pretty generic, around the mill villainous stable that just uh, beats up people yeah, and, and, just, uh, and doesn't just... really do anything else. And they are not very effectual or effective, because they get beat up by the good guys on a regular basis. Joe Hendry pretty much had to fend them off all three at the same time to win one match with one of them. Yeah, I see what they're going for because you know prospects, you know the prospects of future and yada yeah. yada. But yes, but still, uh, it makes me think of prospectors. I know, <laughs> it's but kind of funny. I mean, I could see this team being decent at being a heel team. They need they, work, but they need a yeah. I was gonna say they need a lot of work. The business itself needs to grow a bit more before they can become a bit more. Of a threat. <laughs> yeah, speaking of the business growing, I am a bit concerned that the loaded runtime has already become two hours long in their second month. It's like they are growing a bit too fast without properly setting up their foundations. Because if you think about it, they don't have a really big roster as of now, and all of the roster members are basically already contracted with other British promotions, such as ICW and NGW. Yeah. And they have these American imported talents, which are going to basically be part-timers. Aaron Stevens comes to mind. Yeah. <laughs> they had to uh, relinquish Rad Moan this episode. Yep. So perhaps... One hour long shows would be much better and would make for a much more compact dose of wrestling on a weekly basis. Up until you get a bigger roster and you can actually afford to have uh, longer shows. Because if you have already two hour long shows, you run the risk of setting up the same matches over and over again and going over to 50-50 booking and that's no good. Also, yeah. you're already making the same mistakes TNA made when it came to wrestlers getting put over your local stars just because they are former WWE employees. And again, Aaron Stevens comes to mind. Yeah. In fact, I want to say something about Aaron Stevens, a.k.a. Damien Sandow. Go ahead, because it's most likely going to be the feelings I have about it. Okay. The internet loves Damien Sandow because he's funny and charismatic. Because no matter all the horrible things that the WWE obliged him to do, he still pulled them off because of his sheer charisma. And he is charismatic, he's good at the microphone and everything. Yep. He's not a great wrestler. He's yeah. okay. He's okay. He's a good worker. He's okay. He's decent. But he is not a CM Punk. He is not a Christian. He is not a Cody Rhodes. He is not even a Ryback. There, I said it. <laughs> oh my god. And I purposely named those names because they had a similar history. 
yeah. of, Sand, of leaving the company at a specific point and doing something else. Now, Sandow has a decent story going on. Yeah. Um, since he was mistreated by the company and never actually put any stock in him. So now he came into this other company surrounded by people which are all internet smarts and they all love him yeah. unconditionally. And so he has a good story going on. The problem is he gets put in the main event as soon as he shows up. Yeah. He gets basically put over far more deserving, in my opinion, or far more deserving talents than were already established in the company. They were already actually the pillar stones of the company, such as Joe Hendry, even Joe Coffey. And they actually worked it in in an angle tonight. Yeah. Uh, but here's the thing. Yeah. Like I said, Aaron Stevens is merely okay. The only reason he gets put over everyone else is because he's a former WWE guy. And that's really not good for your promotion. Nope. I but, would uh, agree on that one. And the worst part is that it's the same mistake that TNA made over and over again. As soon as Christian jumped over to TNA in 2005 and delivered a promo against WWE, he was put immediately in the main event and he immediately won the title. He was put over the locally groomed superstars because he's a former WWE guy which means more exposure, which means basically admitting that you are the inferior product compared to the WWE company. And they are doing the same with Sandow. Yeah, they... I just... Uh, you know my feelings on this, because uh, I just feel that uh, any time a wrestler comes in, despite their past experience, I feel it makes more sense for them to climb the ladder. Just well, there are exceptions. I mean, Kurt Angle is an exception, but Kurt Angle is a living legend. <laughs> so it makes sense. He would have a, a Royal Rumble to decide his opponent because he is a wrestling divinity. <laughs> so that makes sense. But Damien Sandow is just Damien Sandow. Internet, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to say this. Not really. But he is not your intellectual savior of wrestling. He is just merely an okay wrestler. At least from what I've seen of him. Which, honestly, it's not all that memorable. So, they give him this match against the veteran British wrestler Doug Williams. Uh. Which, by the way, he has actually a pretty good gimmick. He is the Brexit guy. The uh. hyper-nationalist guy, which is very topical, and it's a very effective heel because of that. Yeah, I, I do not like my politics invading anything. It can be done right, and I think Douglas uh, Williams is doing a good job in that, especially since he's not hammering it so hard. It feels like as if he... Yeah, he doesn't do it too hard, but he does it with the most heaviest mallet you can find. Just so then it, it hits you and you are left with literally the impact of it in your skull. Okay, so it makes sense for Doug Williams, given his legacy, to be in a number one contenders match in his debut. Yeah. But Damien Sandow? Damien Sandow? Really? I would have less trouble, less issues with Cody Rhodes being in that position because Cody Rhodes is really good. <laughs> you know? Yes, I know. There's that. <laughs> Can I also say about Aaron Stevens that I didn't really care for the, uh, against Doug Williams, the showboating that lasted way too long. Yeah. Because, well. I mean, it was good at first, but then it kind of just stayed there for like what felt like 30 minutes <laughs> yes well and the match itself uh it was not good no especially okay. uh 
uh, one moment. Uh, yes, uh, I have to give props to Doug Williams to having the fortitude to actually finishing that match after he took that horrible spot in which he landed on his head. Good lord, I thought the man killed himself. That was scary. This match was supposed to put over Aaron Stevens in a big way. It actually ended up putting Doug Williams over because of the courage he showed actually finishing that match. So Damien Sandow, Aaron Stevens, I'm sorry, did not look strong, did not look ready for the main event scene. He just looked like... Okay. The embodiment of overhype. <laughs> then again, this week he cut a promo against Adam Blampier in the middle of the ring, and in spite of the microphone's audio not being the best, it was a pretty good segment, and you can definitely see why the guy could have potential as a main eventer because of his sheer charisma. Yeah, I definitely saw that in how he was uh, presented himself as well. Yes, he played the crowd like a fiddle. Speaking of this week, I actually want to address a nagging... Well, another nagging, nagging element of this promotion that really nags me because it is so nagging. What is the nag? Let's talk about Prince Amin. Oh, no. <sighs> oh, gosh. Prince Amin. Okay, let's... Let's put let, this on the table first. He's a good wrestler for what he no, does. No, he really isn't. No, no, actually, I take that back. I was just being too kind on my own good here. Uh, what I mean to say is we don't judge too harshly. Uh, speak for yourself. <laughs> but uh, Prince Amin is... Um, not good. Not good overall, yeah. Um, he's, not good at all. Um... Because, let's see, the match that he had against Joseph Connors in the Unseen match, uh, yeah. it felt like as if he... I've seen Joseph Connors in matches before, and he had any... And it didn't feel as so stiff and, like, uh, put on, I think, is what the word is I'm looking it, for. Okay, simply put, he is not a good worker. He has, like, four or five moves at best. Less... And he cannot do much. He looks out of shape. And he definitely wrestles like one who's out of shape. I think, but... the, w I think the worst thing about Prince Amin is probably his gimmick. Oh yes, I was getting there. As bad as he is in the ring, his gimmick is absolutely the worst part of him. Yes, because the thing is with Prince Amin, he's, he's playing... The rich foreigner. <laughs> it's basically two gimmicks fused in one. The evil foreigner and the heel rich person who vaunts his riches and superiority to the masses. Now, there are two problems, two massive, massive problems with this gimmick. Yes, you go ahead. The first problem, he's not really good at playing the part. No, no. <laughs> he is not at all. His performance is supposed to call to a really snobby, rich person, maybe with a specific accent or a way to present himself or carry himself. Think of uh, Hunter Hearst Hemsley in his earlier career days. Yeah. You know, somebody who has class, or at least he thinks himself to be classy, and he portrays himself in a regal manner, while in reality he gets really fuggish when uh, it's time to show his true colors. The problem is that he doesn't look like royalty, he does not act like royalty. He's supposed to be a prince of India with uh, thousands of women and gold and riches and heritage, he acts like a generic hooligan, if you ask me. He even talks like a generic hooligan. He does not sell the gimmick. Now, you could argue that that's the point. He is not supposed to be any of that. He is really just full of himself, but he's not really selling it. But in that case, he should not be booked as he is being booked. 
he should lose every match and being basically a Martin Kirby. Instead, he not only wins matches, but he also won a match that forced that kid... Gabriel Gab- Kid. Yes, to be his servant, which is something you typically do with Ted DiBiase characters. So, he's not good at playing his role, and not on purpose. He's just no good. He's no good at acting, he's no good at wrestling, he's no good at anything. I'm sorry to say this, Prince Amin, but you need to work on that. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, Prince Amin, I, I really wish I could say something nice about him other than... Uh, but I just can't for life of me think of anything. But that's not even the worst part. That brings us to the second problem that this gimmick has. It's dead on arrival. Yeah. You're supposed to be this rich prince from India who can afford to compete in the greatest and most uh, famous arenas in the world because you have the money and the prestige to do so. And you show up in a bloody warehouse in Newcastle, in front of 200 internet smarks. <laughs> now, even worse, the very first taping of Loaded, when he was introduced to the crowd, that's how he justified himself being there. He said that he heard that uh, the WCPW crowd was the loudest in the world, which makes no sense because it was the first taping! <laughs> It was the first episode! Where did you hear that? Did a freaking seer told you that? Did you see inside your crystal ball? Apparently one of his thousands of maidens must have told him. (laughs) Okay, this gimmick makes absolutely no sense in the context of an indie promotion that started off two months ago in a warehouse in Newcastle. It makes no sense. It's dead on arrival. It's not well performed. Prince Amin stinks. 360 degrees of stinkage. (laughs) Yeah, I've got nothing else to add because... I want him to succeed. I want him to improve because I see potential in his character occasionally when he forced the Gabriel Kid to piggy ride him <laughs> to the university where the taping was taking place. That was funny. To the university! We need more of that. But other than that, it's no good. Not only he is bad, but he actually brings down everybody who gets in contact with him. Yeah, I mean, but... Gabriel Kid has been reduced to a Virgil and his career will suffer for this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah, I'm sorry to be uh, a mean to you, <laughs> Prince of Me. <laughs> Boo. Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry, very that, bad that pun. Was, that was terrible. So, uh, so, so there's that. Yeah, so that's... So, with uh, Rod Moan's voice being gone from this company, Prince of Mean remains the worst asset that they have. Yeah, that they need to work on. <laughs> On the other hand, Big Demo is surprisingly one of the best uh, assets that the company has. Yes, surprisingly he is. Uh, Okay, the double turn he had against Rampage at Build to Destroy, which was almost ruined by the announcer just keeping announcing his victory while Big Demo was pile-driving the referee, which really takes you out of the experience because the announcer is not reacting to what's going on. (laughs) And new World Culture Pro Wrestling World Heavyweight Champion! And then he's just going on a pile Big drive. Big Demo! I really, otherwise, really love the ring announcer. He emphasizes every single syllable that he pronounces, giving every wrestler an impactful entrance. Just, uh. <laughs> He's a glorious one, that announcer. Glorious! Yes. So Big Demo is actually a pretty effective heel because of the double turn, which was played pretty well, and it's one of the soundest booking decisions I've seen so far in this promotion. Yeah. Even though it's really nothing new, but it's well executed at the very least. 
And Big Dame is actually pretty effective as a heel on his own terms as well. Not yeah. necessarily when Adam Blampier is around to sing his lords. Um, especially if you see him against uh, Joe Coffey this episode. Uh, this recent episode of Loaded. They had a really good match, which I thought was going to be much shorter because the primate just attacked Joe Coffey prior to the match with a steel chair. Why do they have red steel chairs? To stand out? Anyway. So they had a really good match, and Big Damon won clean with his spectacular finisher. That's the, the other finisher that I said earlier that was really good. Easily the best finisher in the entire promotion. Yep. And uh, not to mention, it was a great match all around. Everyone... Oh, yeah. Joe Kofi was... Really sh- pulling his weight. Yeah, pulling his. That's really what I was looking for. Pulling his weight, throwing those punches. Damo was like, uh, going, well, there is one critique I had to give to Joe Coffey that half way through the match he forgot to sell his uh, injuries. Ah, uh, yeah. But uh, on the other hand, that made Damo even look stronger than he was supposed to look already because it looked like he actually beat up. Joke off without taking advantage of his injuries because he was not selling them anymore. So he really looks strong, not in a heelish way because of that. But he still looked pretty convincing as a heel overall, especially in the way he mocks Joe Coffey and he smiles and comes down to the ring looking as confident as he can possibly be. Yeah. And when he actually got face-to-face with Adam Pacitti, actually performing well in being a threatening big villain guy... Yeah. Adam Pacitti not being so good, on the other hand, but that's besides the point. Anyway, so Big Demo is actually a pretty good heel wrestler, and I hope he beats the absolute living bowels out of Aaron Stevens next week. Which is obvious, really, that's gonna happen. I mean, I, there is no tension or suspense whatsoever in that match, because we all know that Aaron Stevens is actually going to be employed in TNA, so there's that. There are far better places to end up than TNA, Aaron, even for you. (laughs) He's going to have a feud with Broken Matt immediately. (laughs) I imagine that. (laughs) Brother Aaron, I knew you'd come crawling back to me, even though we never met before. Uh, I will now play the piano to summon him. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, well... (laughs) Okay. Oh, oh, and another thing. Yeah. They had the women's division debuting. Ah, yeah. Bea Priestley and Nixon Newell. I'll be brief about it. Yeah. Aside from a horribly botched, horribly, horribly botched Canadian destroyer that almost single-handedly ruined the entire women's division even before it had a chance to start. Yeah. The match that they had did a good job in establishing their characters. Bria is a sick freako that treats people like dirt and shoves her chewed up gum inside people's mouth. Yeah. To just demonstrate how tough and absolutely awful of a person she is, which is great. Great stuff. Yeah. While the other one is the Hulk Hogan of the women's division, I guess. <laughs> Just uh, hulking up every once in a while. Yeah. Not selling. And they had a brawl, a backstage brawl this week. And by that I mean Bria just uh, attacked from behind and absolutely destroyed her. Yeah. So they're going to have a rematch next week. I hope... The whole women's division is not just these two, because... Well, I'm, like, I'm really hoping there'll be a couple more women coming into the wrestling fray soon, because just having these two just seems like it's a bit uh, too small. Well, they don't want to introduce all the women at the same time. Otherwise, they might fall into the same mistake of the so-called Divas Revolution of 2015, which they introduced too many women at the same time, nobody got over. Yeah, uh, that's what I mean. Uh, Just basically slowly but surely introduce us to more female wrestlers. So I believe that about covers it for uh, this week's wrestling podcast. 
specifically WCPW loaded centered podcast with a bit of everything else thrown into the mix. Yeah, I can't really think of anyone else right now at the uh, top of my head, really, or any other complaints or anything. It's two hours long, it feels like it's three hours. Yeah, too soon for two hours, man. (laughs) Ironically, I wish Raw would go back to be two hours long. (laughs) Uh, Okay, so once Raw goes back two hours, then WCPW will go back to one hour. (laughs) Raw will never be two hours long again. Yeah. Oh yeah, I just remembered. I realized something while watching one match with uh, Slater and Moss versus Prospect. Mm -hmm. If you were to make it into an anagram, it'd be S and M. Well, that's nice. (laughs) Nice. Yes. (laughs) It's another match that Prospect lost, by the way. Yeah. Also, uh, maybe it is part of the WCPW complaint, but uh, it's mainly about what culture, because I find it very pointless for a WTF moments of WCPW. It's like... Yeah, well... It seems like a really pathetic and transparent shield against criticism. If we criticize ourselves in an ironic manner, nobody will bother to do so, and yet, here we are. Yeah, we're here criticizing you guys. (laughs) Maybe we don't have anything better to do. Yes. On the other hand, we like wrestling, and... Overall, we also like Loaded. Flows aside, I'm glad it exists. I said that already yeah. earlier on. And as fans, we have the right to criticize what we feel are wrong-headed decisions. Yeah. <laughs> like everything revolving around Prince Amin. <laughs> or letting Rad Moan speak. Or for some reason, this... Really nitpicky detail of Eligaro's mask having a bull spot. And I really don't understand why it has a bull spot. It drives me nuts. (laughs) Only you then, because uh, I don't really care, personally. It drives me nuts. It keeps you awake at night. Why is it there? (laughs) Uh. (laughs) So anyway, there's probably more to touch upon WCPW, but we'll have future iterations of this podcast to discuss about that. So I guess we can actually end up on a high note. Yeah. Uh, Yes, Eligaro's mask bold spot. That's a high note. (laughs) Yeah, so yeah, that's a high note. I will want to say one thing to WCPW, and that is, Please don't send Big Dame around to my house and uh, destroy me for saying things. <laughs> we mostly said positive things about Big Damo. If anything, you should be worried about Prince Amin. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot say that with a straight face. <laughs> you know, it'd be even more funny if they just sent Martin Kirby around. You know, he actually shows up piggy riding Gabriel Kid. <laughs> Says, you dare speak ill of Prince Amin! I will destroy you! Gabriel Kidd, destroy him! I command you to destroy him! And Gabriel Kidd, yeah, okay, sure, whatever. <laughs> Just slapped me on the wrist. <laughs> I told you to destroy him! <laughs> Oh, Prince uh, Amin. Prince of- oh, he's going to give us a lot of material. <laughs> if this <laughs> keeps fair. How sad it is that in the same promotion that has Martin Kirby, which is a wrestler specifically designed to be a complete buffoon, we can take him more seriously than Prince Amin. That's How sad. sad it is. <laughs> that is very sad. Uh... uh. But yeah, so so thank you all for watching and listening to our really, really, really long banter about uh, wrestling. 90 minutes long, actually. Uh, Freaking heck. Give, give or take a few cuts or edits. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so again, thank you for listening to the entire thing, if you did. Good lord, what are you doing with your life? Jesus! <laughs> Uh, But uh, I'll say this Next time 
We'll spend 90 minutes talking about Joe Hendry. I just want to bask in his wonderful glory. <laughs> Glorious! <laughs> That'd be hilarious if you could do uh, <laughs> a song. Actually, you know what? What? You know what? When his partnership with uh, Joseph Connors will inevitably implode. Yeah. And he's going to have a very personal grudge match against Joseph Connors. Yeah. <laughs> For his match against him, I want him so bad to do a cover of the No Mercy theme by Jim Johnston. <laughs> It'll be like... Joe Hendry now, there's no more forgiveness for Joseph Connors. <laughs> <laughs> that would be great. Yes. So yeah, enough distractions and... So yes, anyway, this has been Hell My Dog! And I've been Devar. Prince Which... Devar. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Uh, actually, another thing I noticed. Apparently, my name, I found that my name, if you switch the letters around, it makes the name Vader. <laughs> okay, so this has been El Madog and Big Van Devar. <laughs> <laughs> Ready to smack around that little punk Will Osprey. <sighs> He's up! He's up! <laughs> I s slap him on the wrist. <laughs> Oh boy. Uh, good night. Okay. And take yes. care of yourselves. Yes, indeed. Take care of yourself. Gabriel Kid, take me to the university right now. I have a match to lose. <laughs> I have to look silly in front of a live audience. I had to, for some reason, have an interaction with the primate. <laughs> <laughs> oh boy. Okay, Prince Amin is going to be a running joke here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway, good night, everybody, and uh, don't get caught in a pile driver. Mm, yeah, especially bad. when everyone says it's a banned maneuver and stresses it ten yes, times. And, and yet, Big Demo tries to do that all the time. <laughs> uh, yeah. Joe Henry now There's no more forgiveness No running now Cause you've made it my business Etched in my mind